Hello, today we will be watching Squatting Slav TV, where he will be talking about Ben Shapiro and Milo Giannopoulos, which we have watched well, not too long ago, and they made some really good sense right in these conversations. But let's see what the darker picture of these two characters are. <laughs> Squatting Slav TV. Over the course of the last two years, both Ben Shapiro and Milo Yiannopoulos have traveled across the US and internationally to speak about the evils of identity politics and especially white nationalism. These events typically attract thousands of young people and because they're normally hosted in cities that are SJW hellholes, the security and policing fees accompanying these events are oftentimes running in the hundreds and thousands of dollars. When Ben Shapiro spoke in Berkeley in September, the security fees were estimated to be around $600,000 and Milo's recent event in Sydney also came with a $50,000 security price tag. Multiply this by a couple of events each year and you're looking at the hell of a lot of money being spent on protecting a short guy and a gay guy whose battle to save free speech has been anything but free. All of these high costs aside, what's more troubling is that these two prominent conservative pundit speakers are pushing a hypocritical agenda that their masses of based Trump supporters seem to be completely blind to. As we all know, Ben Shapiro is a proud Jew and has openly called himself a Zionist on several occasions. I'm loyal to the, the Zionist vision uh, of Israel, the religious Zionist vision of Israel in particular. Since there's a lot of misconception about this term, Zionism is essentially a right-wing Jewish religious and ethnic movement for the re-establishment, development and protection of the nation of Israel. Basically, Zionism is the belief that Judaism is both a religion and an ethnicity and that based on this, Jews deserve their own ancestral homeland in Israel. Milo, just like Ben, is also a Jew because according to matrilineity in Judaism, those who are born with a Jewish mother, as is Milo, are automatically themselves Jewish by blood. Although Milo insists that he was raised predominantly as a Catholic when speaking to the masses and continually tries to downplay his Jewish ancestry, it's not very hard to realize that his Jewish identity is actually a big part of him, his ideologies and his values. My mother is, is Jewish, so according to Jewish law, I'm Jewish, matrilineally speaking, that's their rule. With all of this now in the open, you kind of have to ask yourself why it is that both of these guys, who are so openly proud of their Jewish identity, so harshly condemn and demonize identity politics, and especially white identity politics and nationalism. If Ben Shapiro can be a proud Zionist Jew and stand by the idea of an exclusively Jewish homeland, then why is he so bothered if a white American wants the same for his country, or if a Swede or a German want the same for their countries? In fact, when asked about his own ethnic identity, Ben Shapiro made it very clear that he identifies first and foremost as a Jew, whose loyalty is to Israel, and then secondly as an American. Of what is your identity? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a Jew who is an American. Um, I don't feel that those values are in conflict, um, but obviously, you know, my Judaism is is key to my value set and and key to my identity. Uh, so that that's uh, you know, in in terms of my personal values and in, in terms of what I value most when it comes to you know the, the values that I hold dearest. Those are obviously Jewish values. Therefore, when you go to one of these based Shapiro events you're actually going to an event where the speaker believes in putting Jewish values first and American values second. Sadly, the cult-like followers of both Ben and Milo don't seem to realize this at all because both of these guys have done such an excellent job in diverting their audience's attention off of identity politics and instead shifting it onto shared values such as the protection of free speech. Basically, for Ben Shapiro, identity politics are completely acceptable if they work in favor of Jews and the preservation of Jewish identity, but if they're based around whites, nationalism or white identity, then they're automatically supremacist and Nazi. Okay, well, if you're going to do identity politics, you will see some white identity politics from the right, which I think is really negative. On top of this, Ben Shapiro, who has stated on numerous occasions that he condemns violence from the side of SJWs, has been a proud supporter of US intervention in Syria and the toppling of Assad's regime. There are all these pictures of dead children who have been gassed to death by the Bashar Assad regime. And that comes just a few days after the Trump administration came out and said Assad would remain in power. As we know, Syria and Israel aren't exactly on the best of terms, 
Yet Ben thinks it's perfectly acceptable to support a war in which young Americans will lose their lives to serve the interests of Israel. Much like Ben, Milo has also been extremely shifty with identity politics from the time that he started gaining popularity. Two years ago in the pre-election era, Milo bragged about being part of the alt-right when the movement was painted by the mainstream media as a bunch of white trolls with Pepe memes, but then distanced himself when the media learned that the alt-right was about identity politics. Basically, Milo rode the wave of the alt-right when it brought him media attention and popularity at a time when the movement wasn't clearly defined by the media, and then jumped off of it and began to demonize it as soon as it began to conflict with his own views of identity. Milo has also continually equated nationalism and identity politics with white supremacy, and has always tried to downplay and subvert these movements by making it seem as if anyone questioning Jewish involvement in politics was simply trolling. Sadly, Milo is nothing but an opportunist who uses an artificial conservative cloak to normalize things such as pedophilia, all the while attracting thousands of virgin cucks who think that asking a gay guy for dating advice is fucking based. Question, uh, yeah, so as a young single conservative, uh, I'm asking dating advice from you as I'm finding it hard <laughs> to find a, uh, a young conservative girl and as the most outrageous man on the right, you've managed to find a life partner. Uh... Anything. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that an entire generation of young conservatives in America worships a feminized gay man who brags about having a black boyfriend isn't only sad, but also goes to show how conservative values are slowly being degraded and penetrated by sheer degeneracy. Overall, both Ben and Milo have done an excellent job in demonizing identity politics in America, all the while sneakily shoving their identity politics down the throats of young Americans. The Jews run everything? Well, we do. The Jews run all the banks? Well, we do. The Jews run the media? Well, we do. While I obviously support the idea of every people on this earth being proud of their identity, I don't support the hypocrisy of people like Ben and Milo who tell others to abandon identity politics, all the while pushing these very same kinds of politics for their own benefit. White pride, white nationalism, white supremacy isn't the way to go. The way to go is reminding them and yourselves that you should be aspiring to values and to ideas. So the next time you go to watch either of these guys destroy feminists or wreck SJWs, just remember there's a much bigger agenda going on with both of them than meets the eye. Now that we have watched the video, Squatting Soft makes some really good points. I mean, these rallies really gain attention and are really costly <laughs> so they're not in quote free speech they're expensive speeches but i do think they are ultimately necessary i mean if you stop having these free speech rallies where they are going to have an opposing view then it's not a democracy then it's totalitarian or authoritarian this collective grouping, you can't just allow that to happen. You need to have these conversations. You need to have these debates, whatever they are having. Because eventually, people will just have one and single thought and totally reject and hunt people that have different opinions. And you can't tolerate that in a democracy like we have. But the big thing that I think is actually very true with these people, because a lot of people think that Milo, for example, is Catholic, but a lot of other people say he's a Jew. And uh, based on the things here that was said and things I have s seen in other places, Milo seems to be admitting that he's a Jew. And he doesn't seem to be very like, oh, no, I'm a Catholic. Huh? But um, they do have their secular agenda because Israel is a state, they want to preserve their ethnicity, and then people are going to be, oh, I'm a Zionist, I like to have them on their hill, etc. And then it's this immediate turnaround when it comes to white supremacy, that we can be white in our countries, that we can have our own nations where we shouldn't even bother with immigration. No, 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 then that's white supremacy, that's evil, that's uh, bad. And these people are no different when, from the left on this. The only thing they do a lot better than the left on this subject is in fact denouncing that they should be in a group, think that they should be aspiring to certain values, exactly like Myler, I think, said in this video where he was highlighted. And uh, this is very important to keep in mind that 
a lot of people that are on this so-called right, they are actually going to say the same things. That, oh no, you can't be a white supremacist, that's evil, that's racist. And I mean, basically anyone that speaks are going to say that. But there's a few people realizing that, well, if you don't preserve your race, etc., it will dissolve. It will not last. And if you look to the Middle East, there used to be white people there. And Greece, etc., used to be blonde people. You know, quite a lot of them. But when the Arabic Crusades, if you should call it that, uh, whatever their totalitaristic expansion happened, well, the, you had to flee to the hills uh, in Greece, for example, where they tried to survive. And in some other places, they were not so fortunate to run at all. They got, in fact, genocide. They got annihilated. Not ethnocide, really genocide. They just got slaughtered. But no one wants to talk about these things. And, well, we're going to see this happening all over here in Europe, Canada, America, etc. If we're going to keep talking like, oh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. And then they're going to bombard people from these Middle Eastern countries and have white people working for them so they can come in here and get benefits, welfare and everything. And uh, apartments even. And a woman, for example, here in Sweden, was a good example, uh, Sophia and her two children, a lone standing mother, she was waiting for an apartment in six years' time and still haven't gotten one to this day. Meanwhile, Mohammed and his three wives gets free apartments for their 14 children uh, immediately, and that costs like millions and millions of Swedish crowns. And this example, continuously happen throughout Europe. For example, Britain, there was a man with his wives and children, lots of them, I don't remember the exact number, but anyways, they got a luxurious big apartment in the middle of London that's worth billions of pounds. I think it was close to 10 billion pounds, if I'm not mistaken. And that's some extremely high numbers. But of course, we all know this, right? But you have to be open-minded and be like, what are these people talking about? Because they do say some really good things. I mean, I basically listen to people that saying this all the time, and it's very depressing for me because I really don't believe that we should uh, reject our ethnicities, that we should be like treating it like a separate uh, secular thing. I think that should be the primal thing we should preserve. And it's not racist in the sense that it's hateful or anything. I mean, sure, it's racist by law to make sure and protect your majority. But if they have that in their own countries, then it should be fine, so to speak, depending on what kind of dumb leaders they have. Because you see some uh, of these leaders in the African region especially, but also in the Middle Eastern ones, they tend to just take money for themselves in the state and uh, produce military factions that will help them maintain governance and superiority rather than actually giving food and clean water for its denizens. But that's the thing. We here in the West, we don't need to take in people and uh, give them food like you know we have everything in the world because we don't we don't have everything in the world it's true we have a lot more than some other countries but that's because we made it to that point not them they haven't gone through the same struggles we have but we have and we have surpassed a certain stage in our primitive form that's just backwards thinking i mean you should be traditionalist. I believe that you should be conservative. But sometimes people are just too stuck in their old ways and just are stuck in the law of the jungle, right? Rather than rule of law. Of course, these people are gonna talk about all of this nonsense that we are the supreme sovereigns of this nation, blah, 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 blah. But they're just speaking of their own power and own interests rather than their people. But here we have come to the census of democracy. I mean, sure, it's not a great system, but 
it's the best of all the other systems because, well, obviously, if you have a totalitarian system, you will have a dictator dictating everything and that will go to hell very, very fast. But also, with speakers like these, there will, of course, be people angry when people are going to mock these people because they are so-called fans of these people because they don't know anyone else that uh, appeals to them, right? So they tend to become pretty much like the left. They tend to become like zombies. They can't uh, see through people at all and they're gonna be like, oh yeah, this sounds good, this sounds good. Oh, I don't know about that, but that sounds probably very good too. And they immediately, when someone like Squatting Slav or me are gonna come and criticize people like this, they're gonna be unsubscribed, I hate you, you're a bad person, you should really go get some help. You know, people are just um, not really tending to these free values they speak of. They don't cherish that. Because immediately people have to be like politicians. I denounce him, I hate that guy. And it's not like I'm denouncing Milo or Ben Shapiro. I mean, I'm always being honest that, oh, I, I think they're good on this, I don't think they're good on that etc. Not that you have to, but I like to be honest that way. But the importance is to always remember that we should be able to criticize each other because if we don't, then we don't have a democratic society. I mean, what's so democratic if everyone are going to think the same thing? I mean, eventually you will only need one party because what's the point of having different opinions if the other opinions are wrong? And really, he's so correct on one thing. People like this, they are really destroying what's conservative. I mean, you have a gay man who says that, oh, marriages should be between a man and a woman. Oh, that's very interesting for conservatives, right? But then all of a sudden, he is with his black husband now that he married. And, well, because, of, of course, he's homosexual and he liked to do that de decision himself. Commitment himself. So he married his black husband on Hawaii, if I, I think, or something like that. But still, I do really enjoy watching Ben Shapiro and Milo Yiannopoulos because they are actually very great minds. I do believe they have a lot of things they get right when they speak. But yes, they have a hidden agenda, it seems. And I'd say you should always be aware of people talking of these things. At least I try to be honest what my agendas are because I quite openly speak about them. But if you can see through me and call me out on something, and yeah, well, you might surprise me, but I'm always ears, you know. I want to learn what I don't know. When I do learn, I tell you. So let's be honest with each other and let's not demonize people because they have a different opinion. I guess that's what I wanted to get out of this video. And Squatting Slav, of course, I think he's very important to highlight because I think he's a very honest reporter, one of the more honest on YouTube, in fact. He was, in fact, banned for a while on uh, YouTube. His channel was taken down because, you know, people who check flags on videos and you have big groups that goes around and are like, oh, Squatting Slav, he was interviewing or, well, in their words, hating on... Uh, some uh, lesbian pride thing or whatever and then they're gonna be flagging all of his videos going to his channel flag flag his channel etc etc and then you're gonna have on youtube these um, media centers that are controlled by anti-trump and leftist uh, movements that's gonna check these videos and be gonna be like oh it's so hateful because he's having conservative views so of course they're gonna shut his channel down. But fortunately for him, some random dude contacted him and was like, oh you, you're squatting Slav? And he was like, yeah, well I'm gonna restore your channel because I think you're good. So uh, he pulled some strings and voila, his channel is back up. And I'm really happy for that of course because I was really saddened to hear his channel go because it's like, wow. He's one of these very open and sensible people on the internet and I really enjoy watching Squatting Slob overall because he does show different points of views, which is something I also try to do. And um, he really touched the dead and disturbed and brings it to life.
and shows the true color of things rather than hearing the narratives of people that sit behind a desk all day and um, really can challenge people as well intellectually. Sometimes I think he might be doing it a little bit wrong, of course, when he challenges people. But overall, I think that's sometimes something you need to do to just get something different out, right? I mean, one, for his YouTube creations to be different, and two, uh, to, re to really just test people. Because I think it's an interesting social experience when you're interviewing people. And th that's what I have come to realize when I have tried to talk with people, is that if you are going to pressure them, they will start to ask questions back rather than answering your questions. And they will try to attack you and make you look silly. But in truth, that's when they're completely dead wrong. Because that shows how lack of knowledge they have rather than them and themselves being actually able to answer the questions you ask. Because if someone will be knowledgeable and answer their questions, then they would answer them. Of course you can ask crooked questions, but I do believe that I ask pretty fair and honest questions when I ask. And of course, you know, people here in Sweden, because I am not doing this full time or anything like that, any real big reporter. But here there's lots of leftists and extreme leftists, I might add. And these people does not take too kindly to a conservative guy asking questions like, well, well, what do you think about immigration? Then they're going to question you like 10 questions before they're going to answer that question like, oof. And they're going to get pissed off and uh, exit the interview. I showed a clip of that in uh, some earlier video where I translated. Because these people, they just hate, really, really hate people that dare say, to say, oh, well, we are Sweden, here should sh Swedish people be. Then it's a hate crime. It's a real big hate crime. And it's a damn shame. But, you know, I feel the pain of other people thinking like I do and feeling like there are, there's barely any people that you can talk to uh, without getting demonized for anything. And don't feel bad if you're gonna be some kind of white supremacist, black supremacist in your country or Chinese extrem extremist, etc. Et because, or supremacist, I don't care really. Because what you're doing is what you should do. You should have a sense of duty to your people. You sh should have a sense of, well, this is my pact, because, because one, it's naturally, and two, you really, have history with these people and free your people built up that country you country your people built up the village you live in etc and then people from foreign countries etc comes and settles there for whatever reason and are going to demand things out of you rather than you having any say about it at all and that's pretty deceiving and uh, mean i say that people would come in with their elbows and be like, move aside people, here I'm gonna be and settle in and demand everything from you and you're not gonna get shit back, you're gonna pay for my family and do everything for us. That's not a really cool style, I think that's common sense, that you should not like people like that. Not of course everyone are like that, but in general you should always look to your people first. Like Trump's agenda, America first. Or Putin, why is he getting so dem demonized? Well, of course, it's because he puts Russia first, rather than the globalist interest which was in Russia before, in communism and Boris Yeltsin, which was a bloody puppet. But when they got Putin, they got a man, they got a real man, not some puppet they could just dance around with. Nope, he was like, I'm gonna make Russia great again, basically, and that's exactly what he have been trying to do. And of course, the globalists have been trying to ruin Russia ever since. So, if you wonder why Russia is so hated, well, that, there you go.
дамы и господа. Dear ladies and gentlemen, уважаемые журналисты, dear journalists. Во-первых, я должен сказать, что я ехал сюда на эту встречу по приглашению президента Соединенных Штатов Билла Клинтона не с таким оптимизмом, который сейчас у меня имеется. I want to say, first of all, that when I came here to the United States for this visit at the invitation of the President of the United States, Bill Clinton, I did not at that time have the degree of optimism with which I now am departing. Вы приехали, что наша встреча сегодня, она провалится. And this is all due to you, because coming from my statement yesterday in the United Nations, and if you looked at the press reports, one could see that what you were writing was that today's meeting with President Bill Clinton was going to be a disaster. Так вот, не первый раз э, я вам говорю, что вы провалились. Well, now for the first time I can tell you that you're a disaster. <laughs> Be sure you get the right attribution there. Я надеюсь, что вы правильно все это поняли. Это доказывает, This proves, что наше партнерство слишком крепко. That our partnership, что наше партнерство рассчитано не на один год, is не на десятилетие, а на столетие, our partnership на века. Is not calculated for one year or for five years, but for years and years to come, tens of years for a century. Да мы друзья. We're friends. И мы только совместно будем решать самые сложные, не только двусторонние, но и мировые вопросы. And that it's only together, together we're going to be trying to solve not only our joint bilateral issues, but issues affecting the whole world. <laughs> Дорогие россияне, осталось совсем немного времени до магической даты в нашей истории. Наступает 2000 год, новый век, новое тысячелетие. Сегодня я последний раз обращаюсь к вам как президент России. Я принял решение, долго и мучительно над ним размышлял. Сегодня, в последний день уходящего века, я ухожу в отставку. Я хочу попросить у вас Прощение. за то, что многие наши с вами мечты не сбылись, за то, что нам казалось просто, а казалось мучительно тяжело. Я прошу прощения за то, что не оправдал некоторых надежд тех людей, которые верили мы одним махом, одним рывком 
одним знаком сможем перепрыгнуть серого, застойного, тоталитарного прошлого, светлое, богатое, цивилизованное будущее. Я сам в это верил. Одним рывком не получилось. В чем-то я оказался слишком наивным. Где-то проблемы оказались слишком сложными. Мы продирались вперед через ошибки, через неудачи. Многие люди в это сложное время испытали потрясение. Но я хочу, чтобы вы знали, я никогда этого не говорил. Сегодня мне важно вам это сказать. Боль каждого из вас отзывалась болью во мне, в моем сердце. Бессонная ночь, мучительные переживания. Что надо сделать, чтобы людям хотя бы чуточку, хотя бы немножко жилось легче и лучше, не было у меня более важной задачи я ухожу. Я сделал все, что мог. Мне на смену приходит новое поколение, поколение тех, кто может сделать больше и лучше. В соответствии с Конституцией, уходя в отставку, я подписал указ о возложении обязанностей президента России на председателя правительства Владимира Владимировича Путина. Прощаясь, я хочу сказать. Каждому из вас. Будьте счастливы. Вы заслужили счастье. Вы заслужили счастье и спокойствие. С Новым годом, с Новым веком, дорогие мои. Of course, Putin is not some angel. I mean, there have been some really suspicious things, like the Polish president going in an aircraft with lots of veterans, etc., and all of a sudden it crashed. Now, the plane, a Russian-built tuple of Tu-154, was on a flight to the western Russian city of Smolensk, and uh, Polish foreign ministry officials say it hit some trees on approach to the airport and caught fire. A Russian official says there was fog at the time of the crash. And as we heard from our Richard Quest, we need to make the point that uh, this particular aircraft has a remarkably good safety record. Now, as we've been reporting, Polish President Lech Kaczynski was on his way to that memorial service we just mentioned in Katyn, Russia, when he was killed in today's plane crash. The service is to mark the 70th anniversary of the Katyn massacre during World War II, and no survivors. Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk is convening an emergency cabinet meeting, and former President Lech Walesa calls the crash an inconceivable tragedy. President Kaczynski was leading the delegation that was to mark the 70th anniversary of the massacre of 
thousands of Polish officers by Soviet forces during World War II. And President Kaczynski was elected back in 2005, and he was expected to run again this year. But it hadn't been proven that it was Russia that shot it down. It could have been some other faction. It could have been sabotage on a plane, and etc. And I think if Russia would have shot it down, it would have been a declaration of war already. But since they didn't do it, they decided to let it go. And I think any idiot would want war with Russia. And of course, there's lots of globalists that push us for that agenda because that will fit in into their eugenics program. And of course, as I understand from watching lots of Putin, he doesn't really want that either. He's really, really opposed and he tries to warn journalists and everything like, like we have to stop this, otherwise it might become war and that war will be the end of the world. And I really don't want that, you know? And if someone is gonna try to warn people like that, I don't think he really wants that damn war. Maybe it's propaganda, it's maybe it's to deter some attention away from himself, but I really don't think so. I think it's quite genuine when he says so. And his anti-corruption is very great because he goes there personally to these corrupt companies that's, you know, sucking money out of Russia. And he's like, what the hell is going on here? And uh, asking some really tough questions to the people in charge can renegotiate contracts or tear them apart right then and there because he doesn't take lightly to corruption. And I think that's something that we would really need out of our leaders. Да я отвечу, Ваня, первоначальный срок в девятом году, который был запланирован, это июнь 2011 года. Июнь 2011? Да. Сегодня... Значит, прошел июнь 2019, у февраль 2013. Да. Какая гарантия, гарантия какие, что... Когда вы сказали? В июле стопроцентно строительный готов. Мы в сентябре, в сентябре 2013 -го года акт ввода в эксплуатацию. Ну, бумажная работа еще. Так сказать, То есть да. задержка с окончательным вводом на два с лишним года? Да. Два года. А с чем это связано? Связано с неисполнением предыдущего исполнителя. А так сказать, как же исполнитель, предыдущий исполнитель. Собственник Красной Поляны, Красной Юридической Государства был то же самое. А кто это? Был товарищ Белов. Ну, товарищ Белов, он э, чем сейчас занимается? Сейчас в курортном сервисе Молодец, Молодец, а чем еще? Ну, не знаю больше. Что Где у нас Белов работает? Ну, Вице-президент Олимпийского комитета. Это у нас вице-президент. И вице-президент Олимпийского комитета страны занимается вот такой стройкой. И так стаскивает. Ну, своя компания какая-то строительная. У удорожание объекта есть? Да, удорожание тоже есть серьезное, но оно, поскольку строится за счет собственных средств, то в данном случае... Собственных средств кого? Собственных средств Красной Поляны и заемных. Понятно, что мы кредитуем за счет ВЭБа, так сказать. Красная Поляна кто акционер? Сегодня, с мая, с мая месяца, да, например? Сбербанк. С мая месяца, так сказать, да, теперь Сбербанк. Значит, за счет Сбербанка в значительной степени? В значительной степени. И это удорожание оплачивается Сбербанком? Ну да, сегодня Сбербанк у него. А сколько? Стоимость этого всего комплекса 8 миллиардов. Нет, дорожение на сколько спрашивают? Его даже тут, ну, там, первоначальные сроки, когда нам, помните, у нас, когда принимали решение о предоставлении кредита. Ну, примерно, в, например, да, Было миллиард двести, стоил да. кредит. Вот, стало? Стало восемь. Из миллиарда двести проявилось восемь миллиардов. Да. Молодцы. Ну, да. Хорошо работает. Ну, пойдем дальше. Почему обратил внимание на вот этот перечень поручения 26 декабря прошлого года? Мы сейчас подготовим еще один перечень поручений. Но из того, что было на 26 декабря, это ведь согласовывалось предварительно со всеми. Согласовывалось. Примерно 80% не выполнено. Я хочу обратиться к вам, дорогие друзья, вы работать будете или нет? Это что такое? Вот подавляющее большинство этих поручений перенесено на осень. 
Хорошо, давайте посмотрим на то, что будет сделано осенью и на то, что будет сделано сейчас э, по, по, по этому перечню, который мы подготовили. Я вас прошу самым внимательным образом к этому отнестись. Для выполнения своих поручений Владимир Путин дал чиновникам время до октября. И чтобы уложиться в срок, посоветовал отказаться от летнего отпуска. Как подчеркнул президент, остров имеет богатейшие запасы газа, а все его плюсы и преимущества местным жителям до сих пор недоступны. Ну что, у нас Министерство транспорта не существует, что ли? Есть, по-моему, вы курируете эту отрасль, да? Что происходит? Да, да, да. Мы, мы, секундочку. Мы понимаем, насколько это серьезно. Это же не, не один автобусный маршрут отменили. Перестали ходить электрички в регионах. Вы что, с ума сошли, что ли? Послушайте, это, это просто даже это не серьезный подход к делу. Это же касается там тысяч людей. Это касается производств. Люди едут на работу, либо не едут туда. Это что, неужели нельзя было сделать заранее? А теперь вы говорите, нужно еще два месяца для того, чтобы эту проблему закрыть. Железнодорожное сообщение пригородное должно быть восстановлено. А за счет чего там да, такой рост? Ведь мы с вами ограничили, ну не мы с вами, а правительство ограничило рост тарифов естественных монополий. Как показывает практика, взаимосвязи между регулированием тарифов и реальной платы граждан не существует. Слушайте, что вы... Значит, что вы мне рассказываете? Как, как граждан это совершенно не интересует. Ну, Игорь Ильич, сейчас вот, что такое, вот, о чем вы сейчас говорите? Если не существует, должно существовать, значит. Ведь люди, когда приходят платить, им платежка приходит, вот, вот такая вот. Вот в Петербурге, в некоторых регионах, так, в некоторых районах, на 40% выросло. Вот они, платежки. Ну, ну, идите и объясните людям, почему это они в январе там, или в декабре, в ноябре должны были платить такие деньги. Здесь в январе, в феврале такой скачок. С ума сошли, что ли? Кто зашел с ума, в Питерском жилищном комитете, кажется, решили вычислительная техника. Описался. Это, ведь сейчас же ручками и карандашами никто не пишет. Сейчас клавиатура. Вы понимаете? Павел Леонидович, дор... Павел Леонидович угомонитесь, Павел Леонидович, дорогой. Ну как его можно было получить такую бумагу, если не смонтированы инженерные коммуникации? Как это можно быть? Вот в некоторых центрах, в некоторых центрах высоких технологий, здесь вот уже докладывали коллеги, с успехом проводят операции по пересадке различных органов, сердца и так далее. Я чувствую, что кому-то нужно голову пересадить. Потому что с такой головой невозможно выдать разрешение без инженерных коммуникаций. С нормальной головой. Или я чего-то не понимаю. Может быть, я чего-то не понимаю. Вот люди пишут, что им там не сладко приходится. Ну, понятно, что это не пионерский лагерь. Да, понятно, что не пионерский лагерь. Но понятно также, что условия должны быть достойными. Но условия... Пожалуйста, вы меня слушайте сюда. Но условия должны быть достойными. Вот не хочется даже все, все читать, но вот в этом, вот этой казарме, которую вы мне показывали сверху, вот люди оттуда пишут, кормят, извините, баландой. Дети не едят это. Это что такое? Это мне что, нужно кого-то на баланду посадить, чтобы там баланды не было? Немедленно займитесь этим вопросом. Значит... И в завершение я прошу камеры выключить. Я хочу сказать следующее. Значит, мы с вами понимаем, что указы должны находиться в зоне нашего особого внимания. И хотел сказать это применительно к аварийному фонду, но скажу сейчас применительно ко всему этому комплексу. А, конечно, это сложно. Вы думаете, что я не понимаю, что это сложно? Я прекрасно понимаю. Проблемы сложные и даже трудно решаемые, но все-таки решаемые. Но мы не решим ее, если будем делать так, как вот сейчас мы констатировали. Мы не случайно собрались именно здесь, именно в это время. Я не случайно попросил организовать именно это совещание, и, и это совещание именно сейчас. Потому что я вот только что сказал об этом, когда еще работали камеры телевизионные. Но как мы заключаем эти соглашения? Как мы работаем? Качество работы ничтожное. Все поверхностно делается, понимаете? И если будем работать так, то ни хрена не сделаем. А если мы будем работать более настойчиво, более профессионально и с пониманием того, что нужно сделать, то сделаем. Значит, если мы этого не сделаем, то нужно будет признать, что либо я работаю неэффективно, либо вы все плохо работаете, и вам нужно уйти. 
Обращаю ваше внимание на то, что на... вот на сегодняшний день я склоняюсь к пер... ко второму варианту. И я думаю, что это понятно. Но чтобы не было никаких иллюзий и недопонимания, чтобы мы по-честному друг другу разговаривали. But for now, I think I'll be settling what I've said here today. And I hope you enjoyed Squatting Slav's report because the more people do things like this, the better. Because it can help people get more honest and, of course, keep a good balance in the world. That we are not letting anyone get too grow big and corrupt and powerful because that's exactly what a journalist are supposed to do. They're supposed to investigate big powers like governments, etc., companies, and make sure they won't grow too big and corrupt and call them out and expose them when they do something wicked and evil. But of course, our media are bought nowadays. And like they said, the media is controlled by use, the blah, blah, blah is controlled by use, everything is controlled by use. Yeah. Maybe you should look into that. For example, Swedish media is controlled by Bonnier, which are owned by Jews. So a large majority of Swedish media companies are in fact owned by Jews. Not sure if this is all related to things like the Kalergi plan and that stuff like that, but it's really suspicious because they tend to have the same agendas overall that there should be no white supremacy, etc, etc, except migrants. Then you get really like, huh. It's not like people like at least me believes that every Jew is evil or something like that. It's just that it tends to be that when you look onto people like Rothschilds, etc, George Soros, their backgrounds are going to be Jewish and you can't deny the fact that these people are very evil and they're really globalist top evil of the world, you know. So when so many of these people are going to be Jewish or well supposed Jews because I don't really think they believe in God. I think they're closer to Satan or themselves being nihilistic evil creeps than anything rather than actually being a true Jew following the Jewish faith. It's like hijackers, it's like the Pope in the Vatican. He's really a pedophile that has his ringleaders around him and he's surrounded by politicians that pr helps protect him, etc. And that's the game. It's a really a political game where the people on top are the ones being these uh, shining example, right? But they really, really aren't. Because the people are the shining example. And it is those we should remember. And I don't believe that the Israeli Jews necessarily wants exact f same things as these great people. And remember, Hitler, George Soros, and who else? Alexander the Great, any great people throughout history, George Washington, no matter what you think about these people, whether they were good or evil, they were nonetheless great. And that is something everyone should keep into account. Because these people helped move the world forward or backwards, depending on how you see it. But nonetheless, they helped to move the masses to some direction. But I think it's just really important to mention these facts that there are people on the mainstream media, etc., talking about these things sometimes, and they, they're gonna label it as hateful, anti Semite, Jewish conspiracy theories that they're trying to destroy the world, etc. But, um, well, it's not as much as a conspiracy theory, it's more like a conspiracy. And at the same time, I don't think that it's necessarily a Jewish plot. I mean, Kalergi, he seems to be, of course, hell-bent on this Jewish leadership thing. But ultimately, I think it's atheist. I don't think they have any God but themselves. They themselves want to be God. They are wicked. They are evil. That's the moral of the story, is that the people don't want people to have gods. They want themselves to be gods. And when people have this wickedness within them, they will do everything they can to grab their power. 
And it is those we need to stop because ultimately they are the ones that's going to form technocracy. And with technocracy, we will lose all freedom. All people will be slaves to the, well, I guess you should call it the new gods or whatever. God bless you people. And in the meanwhile, this is where I get off.